Edward Samuel Corwin was born on January 19, 1878 in Canton, Michigan to Frank Adalbert Corwin, a farmer, and Dora Lyndon Corwin, an advocate for women's suffrage. Edward was affectionately called Ned by his family, friends, and later his close colleagues. He attended Plymouth High School and had early interest in science. Particularly, astronomy became his passion. This didn't come as a shock since his grandfather loved the field as well. However, Ned's interest in science soon shifted to politics, law, and history in 1896 when he entered the University of Michigan. Professor Andrew C. McLaughlin, Edward's mentor, became a prominent figure for Ned after taking his class, Political and Constitutional History of the United States. He was elected president of the class of 1900 and graduated Pi Beta Kappa. He received his PhD degree and took a break from school to teach high school history classes back in Michigan and then in New York. In 1902, Corwin returned to the University of Michigan. There, he became McLaughlin's teaching assistant for the next two years. In 1904, Corwin accepted a fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. He had a PhD by the spring of 1905. Professor John Bach McMaster told Ned about a new preceptor program at Princeton University, headed by the president of Princeton, Woodrow Wilson. On Monday morning in June of 1905, Corwin arrived in New Jersey and headed to Prospect House to apply for the position. He received word from Wilson two or three days later that he was now a staff member at Princeton. His first year salary was $1,600. After moving to Princeton in the summer of 1905, Corwin resided at the campus bachelor club. His colleagues began to call him the general due to his rigid stature and personality as well as his tough class constitutional interpretation, which was often rated the hardest and best course available. Princeton renewed Corwin's year-long contract for another four years. His salary was bumped to $2,000 a year. Corwin was born a Republican while Wilson was a Democrat. Because the two had very different views regarding politics, Corwin would speak out against him. Nevertheless, Corwin respected Wilson and had a personal loyalty toward him. Wilson obviously felt the same way because in December 1908, he asked Corwin to be a new contributor to his book, Division and Reunion. Corwin accepted because this was his chance for a professional reputation as well as a source of income. Corwin married Mildred Sutcliffe Smith on June 28, 1909. Mildred was from Ypsilanti a city in Michigan. According to Corwin, she was his most encouraging and constructive critic. Corwin became the highest paid preceptor when he gained a five-year contract with Princeton at an annual income of 2800 By 1911, he was promoted to full professor. The faculty members had an informal meeting called the Snuff Club, which Corwin was becoming a leader of. Edward voted for Woodrow Wilson, who became the President of the United States on March 4, 1913. The personal friendship between the two slowly started to dwindle with Corwin at Princeton and Wilson in the White House. In the fall of 1917, Corwin went to Washington to help out the Committee on Public Information. He helped to edit a book called War Cyclopedia. When he returned to Princeton, Corwin was appointed the first lieutenant in the ROTC. Corwin was no doubt an extraordinary man with intelligence beyond most. He had novel theories on judicial review, due process, and federal treaty making powers. His expertise in constitutional law made colleagues in awe of him. In 1918, Corwin succeeded Wilson as the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence at Princeton University, becoming the third person to hold this position. Corwin held the position that the Constitution should meet modern needs. He wrote The Constitution and What It Means Today in 1920. Furthermore, he regularly was published by the New York Times because of his extensive knowledge of the law. Edward became the Department of Politics' first chairman, which he held from 1924 until 1936. Edward and Mildred Corwin lived on Prospect Street and often opened their home to colleagues for entertainment. The two never had children, but kept busy with students and faculty, who probably became like family. Corwin became one of the first prominent American professors to teach in China from 1928 to 1929. He and his wife spent that year in pegging. Corwin also became one of the few American members of a public international institute in France. In 1931, he became the president of the American Political Science Association. During President Franklin D. Roosevelt's first term in office, Corwin supported the New Deal. Because he was a solid advocate, Roosevelt's administration welcomed him. 
In June 1935, the Housing Division of the Federal Emergency Administration of Public Works hired him for $50 a day. Corwin was the show of credibility that the administration needed. There were talks of Corwin becoming a justice for the Supreme Court if one were to retire. In 1936, Harvard University selected Edward Corwin as one of 66 prominent intellectuals to receive honorary degrees. Perhaps the worst blunder in Corwin's career was the concept of court packing. Corwin had originally shown distaste. However, in 1937, FDR sent Congress a bill requesting to expand the court by six justices if the current justices over 70 years of age would not step down. Corwin, a Roosevelt loyalist, supported him despite previous objections. This was a risky decision considering most were against court packing. Corwin was called before the Senate Judiciary Committee on March 17, 1937 for a hearing on court packing. Here, Corwin was grilled for his change of views. This went on for three hours. The Corwin performed under pressure well. His argument was not enough. Court packing violated the court's independence and the separation of powers. There seemed to be a political agenda on Roosevelt's part as well. Because of Corwin's decision to support FDR and court packing, he would never again be considered for the justice's seat. The first available justice seat went to Hugo Black and three more followed. Corwin would not be one of them. This would highlight a time of disappointment in Corwin's life and severed his ties with the Roosevelt administration for good. In the future, Corwin would criticize FDR heavily. Thus, Corwin had a shift in interest to presidential powers which resulted in the 1940 publication of the President, Office and Powers. This book renewed Corwin's reputation. He steered away from politics and began to be more detached and unbiased. During Corwin's retirement, he and his wife traveled frequently. He introduced his class, Constitutional Interpretation, to schools across the nation, presented major lectures at universities, and remained in the news as the reliable spokesman on almost every political subject. In 1948, the Secretary of the Air Force employed a retired Corwin for a few days in April at $50 a day. Corwin was always glad to lend his help to Washington, who had not called for his help in over a decade. In 1949, Corwin led a project in the Library of Congress to draft an interpretive guide to the U.S. Constitution. This was published in 1953 and became a fundamental resource in all aspects of constitutional law. Corwin came in contact with three more presidents. The first was Harry Truman, who proposed sending an ambassador to the Vatican. Catholics all over the U.S. endorsed this. Corwin, who was openly a non-religious man, also supported this move. This showed a transition from Corwin's early liberal years to a more conservative view, though Corwin did become a leader for the defense of the Trenton Six, a group of black men sentenced to death in a time of racism. The second president was Dwight Eisenhower. In 1953, Corwin accepted the co-chairmanship that was against the Bricker Amendment. He went to a stag party hosted by Eisenhower, where the two were able to chat alone, though the conversation is unknown. All that is known is that Eisenhower announced that he did not support the Bricker Amendment the next month. Eisenhower's vice president and future president himself, Richard Nixon, was highly praised by Corwin. The two men were on friendly terms. Nixon even sent a personal letter thanking Corwin for his compliments and signed it, Dick Nixon. In 1956, Corwin accepted a four-year appointment to the committee administering the Oliver Wendell Holmes device. His final publication was in 1960 at age 82. Edward Corwin spent his later years of retirement with Mildred in a rustic house about a mile away from Princeton University, which is called the Old Stone House. He accomplished an amazing amount of work, including 20 books, hundreds of essays, letters to editors, and book reviews. However, at the end of his life, Corwin became increasingly distant from the public and declined projects, including one to contribute to a book about Professor Robert Cushman. Illnesses seemed to grip him for the last few years of his life until he passed away on April 29, 1963, at age 85. He was buried in the Princeton University Cemetery. His wife died six years later. In Corwin's honor, the building previously called the Wilson Hall was renamed to Corwin Hall. Corwin proved to be a man of great worth, incredible intelligence, and the utmost respect from every person who had the honor of meeting him. His legacy and contribution to history will not be forgotten.